we're rolling. Okay, that's pretty good. Okay, cool. All right, so um, let's take a look at unit four. What are we supposed to know? Oh, we're supposed to know about forces on moving charges in magnetic fields. Okay, good. And then also forces on current carrying wires in magnetic fields. Okay, and we showed that a couple different ways. So we talked about an electron, for example, moving uh, to the right. There we go. Uh, back, uh, going into a magnetic field. And we draw the magnetic field like that. Just a reminder about the Robin Hood rule. Haha, <laughs> A R H R. Isn't that funny? So, okay, so there we go. Uh, we also have the right hand rule. The whole idea that if you have an X that's into the board, you need a dot out of the board to show uh, three-dimensional motion. Okay, so, and uh, the charge experiences a force once it enters the magnetic field. This is for view. Okay, two things to know, magnitude of the force and the direction of the force. Okay, and this is a rather straightforward example because the motion of the electron is directly perpendicular to the magnetic field. Okay, and to find the magnitude, and direction, we can use this little thing, QV cross B, okay? A cross product is something that's a little bit mysterious to you guys, but that's okay. Uh, we can kind of break this apart by talking about the magnitude of the force being QV uh, B sine theta, where theta is the angle between V and uh, B. B, comma, B, good. And the direction is governed by the right-hand rule. Okay, for that one we have the right-hand rule of F on QV, or I, in B. Okay, and a reminder, point your fingers, Oh, let's put it here. Let's put fingers in the direction of the current. Curl your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field. And, um, or in the direction of plus Q. And then your thumb indicates the direction of the force. Okay, so let's apply that here. The electron's moving to the right. So that means the current will be to the exam left. Good. So we can go, go use our hand point that direction. And then we find we want to curl our hand in the direction of the magnetic field, but our hand's not situated in the right direction. So we got to flip our hand around to be able to do that. We can all do that together to feel a sense of community, a little focus so we can see each other moving the hand. So cool. So, and then you curl your fingers into the board and then the thumb is down. Now, the thumb is down at, at the beginning of the motion, because of course, as this electron, here it is, ooh, art, let's do it, yes. do it pink, here we go, pink. So I'm gonna put a little negative sign right in the middle of it. Oh, is that fun? That, I think so, maybe a little bit bigger there. Here's the electron, there, there we go, there's a nice little negative, sign in the middle of it. So right as it's entering the field here, we just found the force, okay? And at this point, we're gonna remove this because generally we say we only wanna attach forces to the object. Yes, yes, okay, I'll put Jenny says yes. Okay, good, so we have here we have V in this direction still. At this instinct, uh, instant, and then the force is down, we just said that. Let's use blue. Yay, colors, isn't it fun? I'm having good time. Right. Force is downward. Good. We talked about this, the force is downward. Is this force uh, doing work on the particle? No, why not, Claire? It's perpendicular to the motion. Perfect. So, it can't do work. This work, this force never does work because in order to do positive work, you have to push from behind, negative work pushes from the front, and if it's perpendicular, it's doing zero work, so the speed will not change, but it will turn it, right? So it'll make it turn down, okay? 
and as it turns down, it will the entire time be pushing perpendicular to the motion, and therefore we'll get a nice little semicircle, or if it was a complete magnetic field, you know, just in a circle like that. But that means that our motion will look something like this. Not circular enough? It's pretty good, right? Okay, so for example, the lens over here. Oh, this is so fun with the colors and the chalk. Isn't it nice? So at this point, for example, it's moving downward. Keep now down. And the force is in that case towards the center. Oh, this is so fun with the colors, isn't it? Cool. Like it? Mm -hmm. Okay, sweet. So we reviewed that. That's good. And now we could also do the same thing with, um, are we still on screen there? When I, when I, I, I don't know where this is here. I can get a little more space there. How high does the, does the video go? Lock down the end. It goes just over the top of the board. Just over the top of the board. So if I push it up like this, we're still on? Yep. How about like this? The top left corner is just barely not, but I think that's still fine. And now, uh, we also have the same thing for wires, okay? Um, good. But we're not going to do that. But the same principle applies. You guys cool with that? And for a wire, we have the force is equal to I L uh, uh, B. Same idea. Okay, cool. And then we have that covered here for our equations. QVB, ILB, all good. Good. And then, of course, the question arises, well, how is that possible? How can a wire or a charge in a magnetic field experience a force? Based on what you know about magnets. Anna? Can you repeat the question? Sure. Why do, why do wires experience forces in magnetic fields? Right, but that's the same thing. So why do moving charges experience forces in magnetic fields? Because they cause non-magnetic fields. The other one? They cause a magnetic field. They cause a magnetic field. They must themselves have a magnetic field associated with them. Otherwise, why would they be interacting with the magnetic field? Makes sense, right? So that's the whole idea of, aha, if this is true, if it's true that there's an F on QV or I, L in B, yeah, that's true. It must be also true that that there must be uh, there must be a magnetic field associated with a moving charge or associated with a uh, uh, current carrying wire. Yep. So everything that magnets interact with in any way has a magnetic field of its own. If there's a force on the other thing, it has to have a magnetic field, correct? Okay. Yeah. Even if that magnetic field is caused by the other magnetic field in the first place, like by ferromagnets, so it's like kind of causing itself, if you know what I mean? Does that make sense? Oh, yes. Okay. Correct. Yeah. What about like just normal things like this table that have electrons moving in it, like yep. semi-freely, like not super freely? Um, does it have like do those electrons make like a mini magnetic force? No. Why not? Because we didn't talk about this, but electrons and atoms actually don't move. Well, that's disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> but they kind of do a little bit because they. But that's another topic. But but it's not. So so I think what's in your head is this. And that's wrong. Electrons do not orbit the nucleus. That would be a terrible thing if they did, because we'd all be dead. Why? Because electrons orbiting the nucleus of the atom would radiate light, 
lose energy and crash into the nucleus, eliminating all elements within like a femtosecond. Okay, Tear. but then there would just be like a soup of particles. Right? Well, it just would be all neut neutrons, but we can't, life depends on there being atoms and reactions. So like you can't have water without hydrogen and oxygen and all that stuff. So we were just one big neutron soup that wouldn't work. No, I know. I'm just like thinking about what would. Yeah, what would there'd be there'd be just neutrons. And where does the misconception come from then? Chemistry teachers. <laughs> <laughs> so but so there's got to be some sort of like. So then, what do electrons do? That. Oh, well, the, I can tell you because you've all seen this picture. Well, I mean, yes, but there's a reason that that picture was developed, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, what uses does that picture have? Like, I remember learning about electrons. Maybe write stuff on here like so orbital. No, because I remember learning right? about the electron was so but far away. Orbital looks like orbit, but it's not an orbit. What this actually is, and then you'll write something like this over here. Right? Am I right so far? Does this yeah. sound like chemistry class? Yeah. Okay. And then they do this to indicate that it's a spherical thing, but nobody sees that, and everybody's thinking about an electron flying around in a circle. Okay, but that's not actually how an atom is structured. An atom is not structured like that at all. Okay, and the reason for that is really, really related to this. But we're skipping a few steps here. Um, so there's just the electron um, that's kind of frozen in the table. It's just kind of like because all the other electrons are like holding in it in check. Like I can explain other. this. Okay, just hold on. Means I gotta build something in between for that. Okay, so let's go there. That's fine. Okay, so electrons have electric fields, and if they move, they have magnetic, magnetic fields. Okay, and we know that electric and magnetic fields are related by Maxwell's equations. We're just doing a very qualitative discussion because we're kind of skipping. And we see that if you have an electron that has a changing electric field, it creates a magnetic field, and it, because that's what the moving charge is, right? And we also know that if there's a changing magnetic field, it creates an electric field. That's Faraday's law, right? We talked about this idea, right? This is Faraday's law, um, that that's equal to uh, E phi dt. The magnetic flux is changing to create an EMF, and that's just, that's got to be an electric field, okay? So it's true that changing electric fields change, cause magnetic fields, and changing magnetic fields cause electric fields. Yes, yes? Okay, so we have an electron now that's going in a circle like this. The electric field is changing, okay? Wait, I thought it was not going in a circle. See, why it can't be true, so I'm saying if it were doing that. Oh, It's right. not doing okay. that. If you imagine it doing that, it would have a changing electric field associated with it. Yeah. Okay? And if it has a changing electric field associated with it, it would change a, create a changing magnetic field. Yeah. And the electric, uh, the changing electric field, the changing magnetic field, would basically have energy flowing back and forth between them. Okay? And they would do that at a very specific rate. Okay? And that specific rate at which the electric field and the magnetic field are related has to do with the permittivity and the permeability of free space. No surprise there, because those two indicate to you how uh, receptive space is to electric and magnetic fields. Okay? And specifically, that rate, that speed, is one divided by the square root of mu naught epsilon naught. Okay? Just related to those two concepts. That's it. And if you plug in the values here, you find that the speed at which that energy is flowing back and forth is this number. And you've seen that number before. That's light. C. So the electric and magnetic fields having energy flowing back and forth between them, that is light. So the electron going in a circle would radiate and that's exactly what happens when you create radiation. Charges moving back and forth 
radiate. Okay? If you have an antenna for your radio transmitter, it has a long metal pole, and what they do is they make electrons move up and down, and that current changing creates the radio wave. Okay? So what we would have here, if this was the path, the electron would then radiate energy away, would lose energy, and would crash into the nucleus. Um, yeah. I thought that the rate at which the magnetic and electric field interact dictates the kind of light and not... Because it seems like... The speed's the, always the same, but you're talking about the frequency. Okay, so... Oh, okay. The speed's the same. The speed is the same for all electromagnetic waves. frequency words. dictates kind of if it's infrared light or... Like Correct. So frequency, we normally talk about it actually as wavelength. So we normally talk about electromagnetic waves in terms of wavelength. So if your electromagnetic wave has a wavelength of 650 nanometers, then it's red. If it's 400 nanometers, it will be blue, for example. Okay. Okay. But this so, does emanate light. Like, this is color. Like, I can see it, but is that only because... Yeah, so okay. I mean, I think, so I answered the question you were thinking, not the question you spoke. Yes. You're correct. The table radiates infrared light based not on the motion of the uh, electrons in the atom, which we were thinking of, but of the motion of the particles due to thermal motion based on temperature. Okay. That's true. Based on the temperature, objects radiate. So the sun is invisible because it's so hot. So what are they doing here? Well, I'll tell you what they're doing here. So they're, they're not trying to show that. Well, I don't know what they're trying to show. I'm not sure what they're doing, but that's what they end up doing. So what is shown here is not an orbital, but an orbital, and they call it an orbital to, I'm not sure if that's intentional, to confuse you because you think of it as an orbit. It's not an orbit at all. It has nothing to do with an orbit at all. Okay? So um, it can't be doing this, okay? But it gets, gets worse because that's not allowed. Well, we just said that. That's not allowed. Can't have that. So how can the electron move around the proton? What other motion would be possible? I don't know. It's zigzag somehow. Yeah, it could be zigzagging, right? You could be like, well, what if we have instead of a zigzag? So we're going to make this thing move this way. Yeah, like that. Yeah, but that's also not allowed because in each case, the electrons are moving back and forth, they will still radiate. So it doesn't move. They can't move. So that means that because that's also not allowed, it is true that electrons in atoms cannot move. They so cannot it's move. It's like the nucleus and then there's like an electron. Yeah, here's where it gets bad. Right? Because now you're like, we got this. We'll just take the electron and we put it there. And we'll just let it sit there. And you know mighty well that's not going to work because you'll have a negative charge here, positive charge here, and it will just fall into the proton. So that doesn't work either. So atoms don't exist. <laughs> so, so it's also true that electrons and atoms cannot sit still. We know that both those statements are true. For sure, we right. know both those statements are true. Okay? They must be true. So they teleport. <laughs> no, it's worse. It's worse. So what must be true is that the electron, see, this is like one of those magic like tricks. Like the... Kind of. We're getting there. So the trick is, as in any magic trick, is that the trick is over before you start paying attention. Right? Because whatever the magician was doing, the magician did before you were even looking. Right? So the trick is here that they've got this word electrons. And when you say electron, you're thinking of a specific thing. And the thing you're thinking of is that it's a point particle. Okay? But electrons and atoms are not point particles. Electrons are point particles when they're in free space, but they're not point particles when they're in atoms. They are completely different. And here's the analogy that I came up with. Are they waves? Is that wasn't that the whole thing that particles are also waves, or are they something else too? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you my analogy and see if that works for you. It works really for me, and not just because I like Nutella. All right. So imagine this is like a big piece of toast. Okay. Wait, which part? The entire atom? It's actually the entire universe. 
The universe is a big three-dimensional piece of toast. Okay? And this is where the proton or, or nucleus is located. And you've got your knife for spreading your Nutella, and you take that and you scoop some Nutella out. And right now that Nutella is your electron. Okay? And then you slap it right onto the nucleus. Okay? And then you take your knife and you just kind of smear it across your board. Okay? You just keep going. And you just never stop. Okay? And if you've gone a long distance on this very large piece of bread, at the end, there's not a lot of Nutella left. But if you're like, mmm, that delicious smell. You're like, it still smells like Nutella. There's a little bit of like a three Nutella atoms still on there. Do you agree? So you've taken the electron, you've smeared it through space. Now, I smeared just in one direction, but you also smear that way, that way, that way, and also those directions, right? So this is a three-dimensional piece of toast. And then that Nutella is smeared everywhere, and it gets just really, really thin, but it's not gone completely. Okay? That is the electron. That Nutella smeared through the universe. So this thing that you think of as a point particle is actually not only distributed, but it's distributed through the entire universe. Is that the wave function? It's related to the wave function. The wave function describes it. Okay? Yeah. It describes but, the status. But that's the weird thing, right? That it, if you observe it, then it is at one place, though. So it's not everywhere. It, so it hang on a second. So, so here it says electrons in atoms cannot move and they cannot sit still. If you now, and I said electrons that are not in atoms are different. So if you now start messing around with the atom and start digging around trying to find the electron in there, once you find it, right, and you're like, aha, then it's not in the atom anymore. Uh, oh. So you've changed the electron back to a point particle. So you can get it to be a point particle, but then it's no longer in the atom because you dug around in there to find it. So that's also why people say that through many worlds theorem that like the, uh, an atom isn't empty space at all. We're not doing many worlds right now, but no, we can talk about that later. But it's related. Many worlds is stupid. Yeah, but it, it also builds on the wave function. Yeah, it's, but it's stupid. But we can talk about that later. Okay. Yeah, because it's, it's not physical. But that's a different issue. It's not physics, right? Because you talk about other universes like and that's, and that's, that's yeah, metaphysics. Okay, so anyway, so that schmear is the electron, and as you can imagine, slapping down this knife, there's a certain place where you're like, come on, I mean, seriously, I don't want to eat the bread over here because there's hardly any Nutella on it, right? I mean, this is not good, okay? I'm not getting up in the morning on a Sunday to eat that, okay? So we can make a little circle, a little sphere around the center and say, here's the good stuff, and we can define what that means. 68%, 99%, one sigma, two sigma, three sigma, whatever, you know, kind of like statistics. Like, just how much of the Nutella is there? And we can say, this is the sphere that has most of the Nutella, and most we can leave up the definition. That's what they're showing. So the 1s orbital, which is not an orbital at all, that schmear of Nutella has a certain concentration, if you put that sphere around the center, at a certain radius, whatever percentage you come up with is there. 68%, 99%, 99.9%. And that's what that means. And they show it as the 1s orbital, which is stupid. It's not an orbital at all. It's nothing orbiting. It just sits there. It does not change. So when a hydrogen atom with the electron has its 1s orbital, there it is. And then five seconds later, it's still there. It's exactly the same. There's no like, or any of that. That's not happening. So the orbital just is. The electron is, it doesn't move. But it also doesn't sit still in the sense of a particle sitting still. Because on average, right, the highest concentration of Nutella is actually in the center, which we were trying to avoid, right? But we don't have to, right? Because in, the or in this example, the Nutella is actually in the center. So the highest of. concentration of electron in an atom is in the nucleus? Correct. Oh. The average position of the electron, so it so depends on how you define average position. If you define average position as the sum of the individual Nutella locations, then that's averaging out to the center. So 
So then why did we like learn that like if an atom is the size or like the nucleus is the size of an apple, then it, the electron would be however many football fields away. Okay, so there's two ways of looking at this average, right? You can look at the position like, of the Nutella and say, the Nutella over here is one picometer meter this way, and the Nutella here is one picometer that way. And you say, between these two points, the average is in the middle. Or you could say, I'm just gonna take the radii, the positions, and add them up and calculate an average distance of the Nutella from the center. Right? Then you'd say, it's one picometer, one picometer. On average, these two points are one picometer away from the center. Okay? And that's, that has meaning. Yeah. And you can, depending on how hard you press the Nutella knife down, right? You can make the Nutella spread most in the center. Or not as much. Right? And if you don't press as hard, that'd be a 2s orbital, right? Because a 2s orbital has basically spread out more. So you're basically allowing more Nutella to reach the edge of your bread. How do you come up with these analogies? <laughs> I do not know. I don't know where that came from, but I was trying to kind of... Like in class, or do you yeah. just sit down on a Sunday in your armchair and just think like Nutella? That, that is the best I've, I've had the Nutella analogy in my head for about 10 years. Is so. this your first time explaining it? No. Okay. No. You're special. You're not that special. <laughs> is, wait, is it the book that Justine gave you, isn't there an atom on part of Nutella? Well, I, I'm going to have to uh, email Mr. or not Mr. Stephen Popel. Popel. <laughs> Maybe I should let him know what his name is in German. But the, the point is here, Popel doesn't know what's going on apparently because Popel's got this image on the front. That's not good. I don't think it's good at all. It's a common misconception. I, I do think a lot of scientists share that misconception. I think that's true. But it is images like this that make that happen. Right? It's true. Why did we find out that it's not like that? And how did we find that out? Uh, so it depends on who you mean by we. So, so physicists were aware and embarrassed by this issue until about 1900. So they were like, <laughs> we, we think atoms shouldn't be stable. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, well, they are <laughs> back in the lab. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay. So they came up with quantum mechanics around 1900, and then they were able to figure it out. They were able to come up with a solution. So a lot of these things that they knew was a problem, okay? They knew was a problem. They didn't know why the sun shines. That's really important too. Like there are certain things they didn't know, but they knew the sun shone because they'd been outside but they couldn't explain why, and they couldn't explain why atoms were, but at least they knew it was a problem, right? They knew it was a problem, and they, they, they knew about electrons, they knew about protons, and they were like, this should be unstable. This should not work. They knew it was a problem, they couldn't explain it. Because electromagnetism, Maxwell's equations, that's 1880, I think. After that, they're like, hmm, this sucks. We thought we knew how this did work, but we don't. So, wait, because, because, what, like, because once Maxwell came out with this stuff and they figured out that this that electrons moving around the nucleus should radiate, they're like. But I thought the problem right now is that quantum mechanics doesn't work with Einstein. Uh, quantum mechanics. You mean like okay, that's a different issue. So you're talking about relativity and yeah. quantum mechanics not being like kind of united. So but they're they're not thing, like right? contradicting each other. They're just not unified. Oh, there's okay. a difference there. So they're not, they're, they're so cool. They're that good. That's good. They both work, but they haven't like, come up with a unified theory that explains them both. Right? Or something like that. Okay, so there you go. There's an Nutella theory. Have you thought about doing a professional YouTube channel life with breakfast food analogies? <laughs> Physics breakfast analogies. I would yeah. watch that. You think you're famous on that. But you would have to have like a good graphic person. So that really? You could, yeah. Not just, not just big bearded man with chalk. It's not good enough. <laughs> you can be Phil, the science guy. It'll have your, their, your okay. own form. I think, big beard is kind of I think Bill Nye probably has that copyrighted. No, you're, you're the science. I know, but he's got it copyrighted. The science guy, he's got uh, that. He's got that probably the science copyrighted. Man. Yeah. Okay, so here he's kind of a jerk, I heard. Is that true? Really? Yeah. I don't know. Are you going to cut all that out of your 
Is that bad? No. <laughs> Am I going to get sued by Bill Nye now? No. No, it's just. Okay. You know, are we still running? Or is yeah. it still, we're still running? Yeah. How much space does this phone have? How much space does your phone have? I think I've got a 256 gigabyte card in there, I think. Yeah. No wonder you can hold all these. What's that? I said no wonder you can hold all, all, all these. Yeah, and I do delete them after I upload them. So I, did, I, I record something and then I delete the video. You don't want to have those memories? Well, there are memories on YouTube. So I can always look it up there unless YouTube deletes them. And I don't like spend my evenings like watching the YouTube videos <laughs> of me doing a class. That would be so weird. So, no. Okay. So, should we go back to this? Okay, I'll take that as a maybe. I thought that was interesting. Was that interesting? Yeah, yeah. Was that interesting? interesting? Good, good, good. But, so those two statements that electrons and atoms cannot move and they can't sit still refers to those like fourth particle electron image we have. Correct. Not to the way they're actually. So could we Correct. rectify the statement to be electrons as point particles So, so, so we can rectify by saying electrons in atoms aren't really electrons the way you think about them. Okay, electrons and atoms don't exist. No, 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 they do exist, but they're just different. At that point, they're the electron, which is, we think of it as, a, as, a, as, a <laughs> as an object, right? But it's really kind of distributed through the universe. And it's like, and we mean the whole universe, okay? So part of that Nutella-Schmier is that Andromeda galaxy, which is really far away. So, like, I'm imagining, like, the electron goes into the atom and it just kind of, like, whoosh, It pops into, into like a, this state yeah, exactly. where it, like it transforms into this thing. This Nutella schmear. Right, exactly. it like confetti's into like this. And it does that instantaneously. Right. When it's captured, and it can also transition between the 1s and 2 state, S stage, for example. And when those transitions occur, they happen instantaneously, and it pops from one state to the other, and there's no intermediates there. This whole idea of quantum physics. Yeah, Anna. But, but does it spin around itself in there? Like, does it hold There is that, around? and that was what I was talking about. So there is this yeah. like inherent, and it doesn't. Does it has magnetic moments, and that's like that's like the, the quantum number m that yeah. you might be thinking of. That's a thing, okay. and it behaves as if it were spinning. Okay. Wait, I don't know what she's asking about. Can you explain that first? Okay. So electrons and atoms have spin. Uh -huh. Okay, either one direction or the other. Yeah. But they're not really spinning. Because they're not in. Because like also they don't have any, I mean, either they have this entire universe size, or as a point particle, electrons have no size. I thought they, what? Electrons are fundamental particles and have yes. therefore no size. But I thought you have you not heard of the chisel gnome? No. no. I thought we learned. <laughs> the Do, math I Do I have to teach you everything? Do I have to teach you everything? The two and a half hours that we have. Oh, fuck. You can, I thought. I'm going to tell you about the chisel.